We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to this open forum by the Internet Society, uh, where we will be focusing on the question around the open Internet and talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done at the Internet Society around this. But then we also have a fantastic panel uh, during this uh, open forum with a broad range of stakeholders to discuss this question around the open Internet. Uh, my name is Carl Gomberg. I'm a senior policy advisor with the Internet Society and will be sort of moderating this session throughout. But I want to kick us off with handing over to my colleague, uh, Rinali Abdul Rahim, who's the Senior Vice President at the Internet Society, uh, for some initial remarks. So over to you, Rinali. Thank you, Carl. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining the Internet Society Open Forum. And a very special welcome to our ISOC Poland chapters members as well. It is wonderful to see all of you here at IGF, both online and on site. Um, we are all still going through a pandemic and it's been difficult for many people around the world. But through it all, the internet has been there for us, a lifeline for people in so many ways, including access to remote work, education and healthcare. The Internet Society champions the open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet. We do it because we know that this particular quality of the internet is what makes it for everyone. And the value of this internet is embedded in a concept we call the internet way of networking. As the internet is fulfilling growing demand and improving its resilience worldwide, there is no better time than now to inspire others to join us in our cause, to build, promote and defend the internet that is for everyone. At the Internet Society, we value the enormous range of diversity, knowledge and expertise found across the whole internet community our collective voice and influence are what is needed to shape the internet for future generations. The theme of this year's IGF is United Internet. If we really want a united internet, we must unite and work together to create the internet that we believe in. This is because there are plenty of people in the world who do not want it. They don't want it to be open or globally connected. They don't want it to be secure. And if they are successful, the internet cannot be trustworthy. We are longtime supporters of the IGF. We are here to spotlight the important work that so many people around the globe are doing to champion the internet. We are immensely proud of the work that the internet society community is doing. We believe that bringing diverse stakeholders together and converging around common interests can help us combat the threats facing the internet today. We mobilize internet champions around the world to defend against these threats. So we are here at the IGF to promote and defend the properties that underpin the internet as the preferred model for network development. We're here to emphasize the importance and value of strong encryption as a primary means of protecting our activities online and ensuring that our communications are reliably safe and private. And we are here to show how greater network resilience benefits all including those who are opposed to it and who use shutdowns as a way to restrict access. And last but definitely not least, we are here to prioritize connecting the unconnected, extending the internet to communities that do not have it and need it most, concentrating on building and empowering the movement of people who can make it happen. As you know very well, the challenges are extremely complex and demand that we all work together for a shared cause. The more we can unite in aligning our efforts the greater the effect that we will have to ensure that the internet really is for everyone. Thank you for listening and back to you, Carl. Thank you very, very much, Rinalia. And uh, as Rinalia mentioned, we are working towards an open internet on many, many fronts. And one of those fronts has been around the internet way of networking and promoting this, uh, this vision for an open internet based on an internet way of networking. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Andrei Robachevsky, for a brief presentation on some of the work that we've done that will help 
sort of tee up the conversation that we will have uh, with the panelists following that. So over to you, Andre. Thank you, Carl, and hi, everyone. I'm uh, Andre Robachevsky, Senior Director for Technology Program at uh, Internet Society. I'm just trying to share my slides. Hi, do you see, do you see my slides well? Yes. Okay, right. So I would like to make a short int introductory presentation just to set up a scene for our upcoming discussion. And in, in this presentation, I would like to present some elements of the work that we've done at the Internet Society um, to um, creating what we call the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. This tool allows us, our community, policymakers, in fact, everyone who is interested to analyze the impact a proposed change can have on the internet. But for doing this, we first need to understand what makes the internet the internet, what contributes to its openness and what the benefits are as the technology use and policy environments are evolving. Because the internet is really an ecosystem. And I think realizing that the internet is an ecosystem is very, very important because relationships and dependencies between different components are constantly evolving and not always visible uh, or obvious. And so is the impact of proposed change. Of course, the internet is not the first ecosystem the we as humans had to analyze. Nature, forests, seas, a social ecosystem have been under study for decades. And in particular, the evolution and impact various changes may have on them. Of course, climate change comes immediately to mind when we talk about impact. But even for smaller ecosystems, it is common that when a new development is proposed, an environmental impact assessment is performed. And because of the complexity of the ecosystem, a simplified conceptual model is often used Starting from the vision and goals, it breaks the complexity down to elements and measurable indicators. So what if we did the environmental impact uh, assessment, but for the internet, the internet ecosystem? Well, um, I think in our approach, we looked at the internet ecosystem from two perspectives. First perspective is what the internet needs to exist without what elements it won't be the internet anymore. And we came to the conclusion that for this is the very internet model of the internet, the internet way of networking, as we call it, and its critical properties. And the second perspective is what the internet needs to strive. And we want the internet to be open, more interconnected, more secure and trustworthy to unleash its full potential. We define several supporting characteristics, things that progress the internet, its infrastructure and its global goals. Generically, we call the supporting characteristics enables. They advance and enable the targeted goals. So bringing this all together, we can come up with a similar conceptual model to what I just showed for in natural ecosystems. Well, let's look at these benefits and uh, these elements in more detail. Beginning with the uh, internet way of networking. As I mentioned, that's really about the internet model, but broader than just a protocol stack. What are the critical elements or properties of the internet that led to its success and continue to ensure its healthy evolution? So working through these essential elements, what we now call critical properties, we also realize that the internet owes its success not only to technology, but also to the unique way it operates and evolves. Unique way independent networks interconnect and co cooperate. Let me walk you through uh, this critical properties of the internet way of networking. Well, first of all, it's accessible infrastructure with a common protocol. All networks and computers on the internet speak the same language. Internet protocol, that's the language barrier that the internet has. So it's very easy to become part of the internet, and connect to it. It's an open, it's based on open architecture of interoperable reusable building blocks. And the thing is you can build different things like a legal model. You can puzzle together technologies and build new systems. It is decentralized. It is decentralized management. It's based on distributed routing system. Um, there are no central authority. There are no network operation center of the internet and local decisions for local needs. 
it has common global identifiers, uh, naming, addressing, they're consistent and unique. And last but not least, is that the technology neutral general purpose network. The internet was designed for nothing in particular, but for uh, everything um, in fact. So the internet way of networking is the necessary conditions. If the critical properties are eroded, so we lose the internet. And when we look at the, what the internet needs to strive, openness is one of the goals. The internet is fully open when anyone can create, use, or deploy the internet and its technologies according to their own wishes. In a fully open internet, any person is free to take any technology that could make up the internet and use that technology to build other things, or even combine this in novel ways, and to deploy them with their barriers and to expect that others will do this in interoperable way. The open internet is also accessible. It is easy to connect, become part of the internet, and use its technologies, services, and applications. Now, you may notice that I describe openness in rather absolute terms, but it is what it was, well, at least it was helpful for us to set this as an aspirational goal and have a stable reference point. Now, let me now quickly walk you through the enablers of the open internet. Um, so I must know that the list of enablers, and I'll show you three that we define for open internet, it's not meant to be a complete enumeration of everything that contributes to a goal. These are listed to inform the analysis and particular our analysis uh, of changes that may affect uh, this goal, openness. But if for instance, you find some aspect of a change that affects a goal, but doesn't neatly fit into the list of enablers, in fact, you found another enabler. So the framework is suggesting is extendable, uh, which is aid, which can aid your analysis. So let me start with the first enabler, which we called easy and unrestricted access. It is easy to become part of the internet. That means that internet connection is affordable, its service is accessible without necessary regulatory or commercial barriers. And when we mean accessibility, we mean it in a broader sense. For example, recommendations developed by the Web Accessibility Initiative strengthen the enabler and therefore make the internet more open. Unrestricted use and deployment of internet technologies. While these technologies and standards are available for adoption without restriction, the internet infrastructure is available as a resource to anyone who wishes to use it. Existing technologies can be mixed in and used to create new products and services that extend the internet capabilities. Well, one example, for instance, to give you is OAuth. Um, it's an example of strengthening this enabler by creating technology building block based on open, unrestricted, and collaborative process. As, as a negative example, opposing example is, uh, you may remember the RSA developed secure ID system um, a great authentication system, but proprietary, which limited its use and uh, deployment. And the third enabler that we identified is collaborative development management and governance. As I said, internet is not only about technology, it's about people, it's about collaboration of different entities, independent entities. This collaboration extends to building and operating the internet and services built on top of the internet. One of the examples which is close to our heart of the Internet Society is the development of internet exchange points. Um, they strengthen this enabler through facilitating open access using no discriminating policies and building local communities. Well, I'll just open because uh, this slide, which is not really related to open, but just to say that we uh, define some enablers for other goals that are important for the Internet Society, such as globally connected, secure, trustworthy. And if you would like to look at the, this uh, work in full, uh, there is a URL at the last slide and the first slide of my presentation that you can look up. So, um, as I said, the purpose of the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit is not just to describe the Internet and its characteristics. It's not just a narrative. It's also a tool to conduct an impact assessment in order to determine if an issue at hand impacts the fundamental 
uh, fundamental principles or properties of the internet or its goals. The evaluation stage is based on asking yourself a question. Does the proposed change affect a critical property or an enabler of the goal? And with this, let me finish this presentation. Um, thank you. And uh, back, back to you, Carl, and let the discussion start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And as Andre mentioned, this is really how we have approached this question around the open internet and trying to provide a tool to assess change and, and make efforts and strides towards that open internet. But as Andre also mentioned, the, the enablers, for instance, that we've identified, is not a complete enumeration. There could be other things in there that fosters an open internet. And importantly, people might approach this concept of the open internet from different perspectives. So to that end, we wanted to organize a panel on this open forum where we invite different stakeholders uh, to talk about how they see an open internet. What are the important char characteristics that they see? And what we're really interested to see is to identify where there might be overlaps in terms of, for instance, how someone from the business community look at the open internet as a engineer looks at the open internet and where there might be differences. Basically trying to see how are we approaching the open internet? How are we thinking about the open internet? And how could that complement the, the work that we're doing at the Internet Society in, in this framework and, and helping analyze change against the open internet. So I'm very honored to have a fantastic panel uh, with us today that is going to drive these discussions and, and help us figure out what a open internet could mean from different perspectives. And uh, I will start with an introduction of the panelists and then we'll have some initial remarks and then get the conversation going. And then towards the end of this panel discussion, we'll also open up for a Q&A uh, from the audience as well to to engage in the conversation and ask follow-up questions to, to the panelists. But I wanted to start with a round of, of introduction of our fantastic panel today. And I wanna start with a big thank you to our panelists who are joining from different parts of the world, uh, in some cases very early in the morning. But first one on our panel, we have uh, Mewi Shansari, who is the head of the digital at Article 19, where she leads the organization's global team digital which works on building human rights considerations in the design, development, standardization, and deployment of internet infrastructure. We also have with us today, uh, Maimuna Diop, who's a senior technical advisor at the Ministry of Economy and Telecommunications in Senegal. Maimuna is an engineer that has a long career in both the government and in the private sector, having worked for Sonatel for many years. She's also uh, has extensive experience and played a major role in uh, growing and supporting the African internet community and its participation in ICANN. She also is a co-founder of ISOC's Senegalese chapter and is currently also on the board of trustees at the Internet Society. With us today, we also have Nick Pickles, who's the senior director for global public policy strategy, development and partnerships at Twitter where he leads the company's thinking uh, and strategic work on critical issues at the intersect of tech, public policy, and politics. He is uh, currently also the chair of the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, as well as on the board of BBC's Media uh, Action and the Technology Coalition. Uh, finally, we also have with us today, Miria Kulwind, who's a master researcher at Ericsson Research, where she works on the design of transport protocols with a focus on congestion control, as well as internet measurements. Uh, she has been an, a very active participant in the Internet Engineering Task Force for many years, uh, having served as area director for the transport area. And she's currently serving as the chair of the Internet Architectural Board. So welcome everyone. And thank you again for, for agreeing to join this panel. Uh, as I mentioned, the idea was that we will start with some initial remarks from all the panelists. Uh, and we have sort of uh, constrained them a little bit in those initial remarks when we asked them to do so. So we've asked them to focus on just three highlights, uh, three main characteristics that they see in an open internet. Uh, so be aware of that when you hear the panelists, they might have more to say about an open internet, but we've sort of consciously tried to constrain them to just three in those initial remarks. And then we will illuminate other aspects as the conversation goes, around, uh, goes on. 
But I wanted to start with Maywish to uh, share her initial remarks on this question on the open internet and the characteristics that you see. Thank you so much, Carl. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I'll dive right in. I think the first characteristic is um, competition. One of the major challenges to an open internet is the presence of gatekeepers because their presence threatens meaningful choice for communities and individuals, whether, you know, whether we're talking about connectivity or communications platforms. I think the second characteristic that I would um, think to talk about here is uh, interoperability. And I think interoperability is, is pretty closely related to competition and you know, having alternatives and, and giving uh, communities and individuals meaningful choices about the services they depend on to connect and use the internet is, is very important, but you, know, you can really only have those choices if those alternatives can interconnect and interoperate with other providers in this network of networks. And the third characteristic I would choose is meaningful uh, multi-stakeholder decision-making in global internet technical policy and, uh, and standards development. And you know, while, while this characteristic may, may feel like a bit of a cop-out, it doesn't feel directly about, uh, it doesn't feel like it's directly about the internet itself. Um, I do believe it's a necessary factor for, for an open internet. Thank you very much, Mayawish. And I, I'm sure we get a chance to elaborate more on that uh, meaningful participation as well. Uh, I want to go over to Maimuna to share your uh, characteristics and vision for an open internet. Thank you, Carl, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here this morning with uh, you at the IGF, and thanks to, to ISOC and all the organizers to making this, um, this session. Um, I, I think my, my first um, interesting characteristic is inclusion. Um, in my opinion, we can talk about access or restrict or unrestrict access if there is no access. I think we need to address the infrastructural need to connect everyone and fill the gap, not only um, the infrastructure gap, but also the gap, the, uh, specifically the gender issue. I had the, um, the honor to be on a session yesterday with Olga and Vint about the, and I have to address this issue. I think it's an important gap we have to fill. And as you can add, the, the, I think everyone know is, uh, everyone know is a multi-stakeholder multi approach for universal access. Universal access is not easy to, to, to address and everyone can, do something to achieve this. And I think it's important to have this multi-stakeholders multi approach, not only at the global level, but also at the regional and, and, um, and national level. I will, I will um, go further on it uh, next. And I think also we, we have to talk about, we have to think about the regulation policy for more competition. Uh, if you want to develop uh, the infrastructure, we need to have kind of regulation which can allow us to bring uh, more competition to down the price. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maimuna. And I'm already seeing a couple of overlaps in the in the competition and the. The, the governance elements of inclusiveness there. Um, I want to go over to, to Nick to share his uh, thinking around the open internet and how Twitter has approached it. Thanks, Carl. Great to be here. And uh, I'll drop in the chat um, a link to the white paper that we actually published last month that it sets out some of these issues. Um, I'm, I'm going to echo some of the points you've already heard. I think um, one of the, the most striking things in my work is, is how often the internet is seen as a handful of companies uh, and actually the internet is far, far more uh, than and a few large service providers. And so the competition that exists uh, online is absolutely critical. Uh, the more competitive the internet, the more open the internet. Uh, secondly, I think uh, an open internet empowers people uh, and it puts people at the center uh, of many of the conversations we're having. And that could be 
choice and control over um, things like ranking and recommendation algorithms, but it's also things like being in control of personal data. Um, and, and again, the, uh, the choice that people have uh, in terms of the services they use. And then thirdly, uh, just to echo a point that Maimuna raised, uh, in terms of open to all, there's an absolute red line uh, as far as we're concerned that um, policies that, uh, that adopt blocking and throttling um, are absolutely incompatible um, with a, a global open internet. Perfect. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, finally, I want to hand over to Miria to share her view and, and your thinking around the, the open internet. Thanks, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, so I mean, I think what I want to say does match what other people say, but maybe in other words, and it's, it's very close to also what Andre said as in Avers, and I see this more, um, I would rather iterate on three different aspects of openness. One aspect is really the openness for everybody could, to connect, to um, exchange data, to access information, which is really goes down to the roots of the internet, because the internet was created as a network initially between researchers that simply wanted to, to exchange data quickly and collaborate. So this is really what the internet is for. Another aspect of openness is also related to competition and access for um, driving innovation on the internet. And for that, from a technology technology point of view, it's really important that the internet is this kind of neutral platform built out of building blocks that um, can create new applications on top that new people can access. And that's also why the internet has been so successful, because it's this platform for innovation. And we have to keep it like that if we want to keep the internet successful. And the third point I want to look at is what I was also mentioned, it's, it's the openness to the internet government process. And that's also very much what we try to support in the IETF. The IETF is, a, is an um, standardization organization which is open for everybody to participate. We don't have membership and it's really important for the process to keep the internet as open as it is that everybody can contribute and engage in this process. So um, I think this is like what makes the internet open and, and what makes the internet this secure, globally connected network of networks, as, as I would define the internet, and we should try to keep it that way by supporting these things. Thank you very much. And thank you all for, for those initial remarks. Um, I think the, the way to sort of approach this the continued discussion was, my thinking was that we could uh, kind of start on those uh, areas where we heard a lot of overlaps, uh, for instance, that competition issue and the inclusive governance aspect and see if we can elaborate a little bit more on those fronts, uh, both what, what might be important, uh, also what might be concerns when it comes to those characteristics like competition and inclusive governance. And then to move to, from there and see if we, we discover additional characteristics that might complement the one that I've already mentioned. But I wanted to start with, with you, Mewish, on that question around competition. Uh, you started talking a little bit about why it's important uh, to have competition, but I wanted to ask you, see if you could elaborate a little bit on why competition is so important for an open internet. Sure. Thanks very much, Carl. Well, I mean, I think the, the first thing the you know, when I talked about competition, I talked about gatekeepers and, you know, I think it's really important to note that gatekeepers exist across the entire internet stack, right? We're not just talking about um, social media or, you know, application layer um, platforms. We're seeing consolidation and centralization across, you know, cloud service providers, network operators, DNS service providers, you know, undersea cable operators, all of whom are providing critical infrastructure services and technologies that, you know, we ironically don't really think about much when we think about the internet in our daily lives. And I think the, the problem with gatekeepers is that they often raise the barriers to entry uh, in, in order to keep their relative market power, right? particularly for small community oriented and nonprofit providers. And that's a major problem because these providers are often the ones that have alternative profit models, alternative technical approaches, and frankly, um, you know, different stakeholders. These are often providers that are the ones that are designing, developing, and deploying technologies to meet the needs of individuals and communities that are the most marginalized from power. So it's, it's important that these types of providers are enabled by the regulatory environment to be able to participate in the market. 
Thank you very much, Nerish. And, and, and that, um, as you say, the, the consolidation and the competition issue is something to look at at various layers in the Internet's technical stack. And I want to go to, to Miria in, in, in just a second to, to get her reflections on that. But before going there, I wanted to bring in Maimuna um, on this question around competition and see if you think about it in a similar perspective as may wish this concern around competition in various parts of the internet or is there particular parts of the internet that you're concerned around a competition sort of hampering an open internet thank you <clears throat> thank you carl i think i really i really see issue in another angle um the angle of of the regulation and to, to bring more competition. Uh, a notable development in competition policy in this trend toward development responsibility for its implementation to an independent agency. Uh, most um, in um, uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, competition has law has been enacted in only 14 of the 15 countries surveyed. Although there is a discernible trend toward adoption of competition laws, both at the national and also at the level of supranational organization. We have a kind of supranational organization in East Africa, it's a common market for Eastern and Southern Africa. And in the West Africa, we have also the West African Economic and Monetary Union, which helped to have kind of um, regional law uh, that uh, will be implemented by the country. It allows us to uh, force the development of the digital e economy and use a sector specific regulation, which can be flexible when the laws come from the region and the regulation should be applied after a proper market assessment and only where the competition law is not sufficient to deal with the issue. I think this approach is um, very interesting when it comes to the regulation, because if we wait for every country to have uh, a competition, the, uh, to have a, a law on, on competition, it will take more time. Uh, to get uh, those competition and have access to the open to an, an open market for for our economy, and we have a lot of things to do on on uh, accessibility because um, when we look at um, the digital divide, even if we make significant pro progress, uh, we have ninety forty nine. Uh, percent of the population in all the African region who are still excluded from ICT service and are most at risk of being left behind. That um, and um, the African Union uh, make an estimation of a need of uh, 109 billion to achieve the universal access to affordable and good quality broadband, and that's why they they have an initiative around Africa, which is a brand bond for all. And the strategies aims to double um, connectivity by uh, 2011 and reach the universal access by 2030. Because um, everyone knows that ICT is helping transforming all the sectors uh, from health to agriculture to transport to uh, enable public service delivery and policy, public management and peace and uh, transparency. And we really need to bring all African people on this uh, internet area. Thank you very much, Maimuna. So the way that I see that is, is the, the, the sort of the relevance of that institutional um, framework uh, in the background to enable competition to promote that digital inclusion uh, is that sort of key piece to the, the, um, the open internet. 
Uh, and I wanted to sort of spin off that to, to you, Miria, to look at that perhaps from, from the technical perspective. We're talking about, as Maimuna mentioned, that inclusion of people to get online and bridging the digital uh, divide. But what could be the consequences from a sort of technical point of view uh, from a lack of competition and how that might affect the, the open platform in various parts of the internet that we might envision? Yeah, so um, you and maybe you already mentioned um, centralization or consolidation as a trend that we see and we also observe that and discuss that in the IETF and, uh, and the internet was built as a distributed system uh, for everybody to connect and um, so we are we're watching this trend and we try in our protocol design to support our protocols in order to make them easy to deploy and limit deployment barriers um, and, and keep like this, this network distributed in a way um, but as uh, my, Mayuna also um, already said, it's, it's not only about technical components and about deployment of these components, it's also there is something for regulation um, that is needed. So this is like um, not in the hands of the protocol designer, but that's something to keep in mind and to keep a dialogue, I guess. But I also want to mention like one small side point that um, centralization is not only bad because we have these big data centers and we have the, the content providers, they are much, it's much easier for them, for example, to secure, to, to, um, to fight against DOS attacks and these kind of things. And you can, as a small provider, host your um, content on these platforms and don't have to build up your, your own infrastructure. So there is a trade-off here and we have to monitor this very carefully to make sure it goes in the right direction. So just on a follow-up question on that, Miria, as you said, there, there could be some benefits of, of that consolidation. Is that sort of a, a tricky paradox almost that some of that centralization or consolidation could actually have as a consequence of making it slightly more open because of those properties of being allowed and or enabling people to, to build new things? Is there a paradox there or is it not necessarily uh, that it contributes to more openness? Um, I think it does on, on both ways. So um, having, for example, cloud providers makes it more open uh, on the higher layers to host your content. But cause, of course, on the lower layers, it, it uh, restricts competition and you have like some few big players. And of course, if one of those players gets attacked and get out of the internet, that has like a much bigger impact than having more competition in different players. So we're also looking at different layers of the problem. And so in some sense, it's a paradox, um, but it's also because we built this internet out of layers and we have to look at the different um, implications of the different layers. So one, one part of the internet might be smaller in that sense, but it opens up something, something else perhaps. Perhaps, yeah. So on, on that note, I wanted to go to you, Nick, because you mentioned competition as well. And as you, as you said in your opening remarks, there's that perception of the internet these days that there's sort of a handful of players out there. Uh, what are the concerns or the, the reasoning that you see around competition related to openness? Is it uh, the angle of consumer choice that's the important part, or is it for new providers to come in? What is the, what is the benefits of competition to openness from your perspective? Well, and just, just to build on the previous comment, actually, I think one of the... Um... One of the trends that we see around policymaking, and this is a very content layer focused trend, is a desire from policymakers for certain types of content to be proactively identified and then removed very quickly. And what happens in that situation is the companies who have the largest data sets have a competitive advantage to build technology to be more accurate uh, and more successful in finding this content. And so the larger the company, the stronger the training data they have, the higher quality machine learning AI models they can build, the stronger their competitive advantage to comply with regulation. And so one of the questions, and I think Francis Fukuyama at Stanford has talked about this as like a middle layer question is, is given the internet will continue to grow, uh, the amount of content being generated uh, will continue to grow at significant rates, but the technology that is essential to protect any service from harmful content, from uh, the kind of uh, the DDoS attack and the kind of um, infrastructure-based attack. The question is, how does that technology support the new entrants to the market, the new companies? Because a small company isn't going to have access to that same training data, that same ML model, um, but they may face the same challenge. And actually, one of the things we have observed in, for example, the terrorist space is, as bad actors have been targeted successfully on the larger platforms, they do then move to smaller platforms who don't have the same resources and the same technology. So 
we need to, to really understand if we want the internet to, um, at scale, tackle some of these harmful content challenges from a competition point of view, we can't have the technology that's essential to do that only held by a few of the largest companies. Uh, so I think that's one piece of it. Uh, the second piece of it, and, and you're seeing this play out around the world, is around um, things like intermediary liability protection, uh, which give companies an ability to proactively moderate content um, uh, and not face legal repercussions, but also uh, when they do uh, take decisions to leave up content, to label content, to remove it, uh, that they're protected from, uh, from lawsuits as well. In the civil case, obviously, that doesn't apply to criminal content. Those laws are far more important for startups than they are for companies with the resources. So I think in, in a number of different areas, this comes back to large companies with greater resources have an inherent advantage. Um, so we need to protect the, the things that make it possible to start a new service, to enter a market. And I think that is uh, the, the basis of competition, that kind of the foundation that you build an open competitive internet on. Uh, and I, I think I, the, the real worry is that some of the larger players um, see a business benefit in some of those foundations being eroded. Uh, and so maybe advocating for policies which you know, will pull up the drawbridge behind them. And we need to make sure that that, uh, that ability to grow and scale is protected for the whole range of services, not just the largest. Thank you very much. And, and I think that was a great connection to what Maria was mentioning. And I wanted to sort of leap, not, well, I want to jump from that back to, to Mary's around this question around um, sort of the abilities that some large players might have in order to secure their service. Um, how, how, how to deal with that sort of um, the challenge that in, in some cases, the, the challenge uh, of competition is is similarly sort of accompanied by a challenge around security where there are benefits in in that scale and what is the role of that inclusive decision making process in terms of like finding a solution to this if are we are we sort of destined towards go down a path where this scale is the solution to everything and therefore we end up in that solution or is there a path where that inclusive uh, participatory governance structure can play a role to sort of mitigate that just dominance by scale. Thanks, Carl. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's it's really, um, these are difficult questions and that's why we've been talking about them for a long time in, in multi-stakeholder circles. I, I don't think they're easy answers. I think from, from a human rights perspective, um, thinking about scale is really difficult, right? Because I think the when we're coming at it from human rights values and, and thinking about those values, um, certainly there are there are certainly trade-offs when it comes to having large providers. And I think Maria made, made an excellent point about um, sort of lower layer, maybe cloud, like at the cloud service layer, you know, having big players is really useful for having ostensibly a more robust um, content layer. But I think um, from a human rights perspective, it can be um, difficult to see that uh, all the way through because, you know, the fewer players there are, um, the larger their decision-making power. And I think when, when you have very few players deciding um, really important content moderation decisions, I think that can have a major impact on freedom of expression if certain, if legitimate expression is somehow limited on a few platforms and there aren't, uh, there aren't alternatives to be able to, to flourish. And, and we see that, um, I think uh, Nick was talking about blocking and throttling content, and we can definitely see how a more consolidated or centralized environment can play into the hands of authorities that want to limit certain kinds of legitimate expression. Um, your question was about meaningful multi-stakeholder decision-making and how that may be, uh, how that that may be important to sort of counter um, the more um, adverse consequences of consolidation or centralization. Um, I think <clears throat> right now it's really important to note that global technical standards and policy bodies that make these kinds of decisions in regards to the internet are largely made up of uh, Global North representatives and Global North um, companies. 
And I think that means that there's a relatively limited perspective that has significant influence over the priorities and values that go into the policies and standards that determine internet technologies for, for everyone around the world. So, you know, if we really want the internet to be open for all individuals and communities, we really need to make sure that these technologies are designed, developed, and deployed with local context and constraints take into account to the, to, to the extent possible. And that's really based on lived experiences. So we need, we need diverse voices in the room where the decision-making is happening often in these, te these highly technical spaces that um, aren't so well known um, in, in the mainstream and even in other parts of internet governance. So I think this really um, lends itself to the importance of having, you know, those small community nonprofit providers, having civil society stakeholders in those rooms to represent those um, those uh, those lived experiences, so that we can take those into to account as well when we're when we're designing these technologies, when we're setting global standards, when we're setting global technical policies. Thank you very much, and, and that brought us into that. Uh, question around the inclusive governance uh, model and, and how my work and I, I wanted to go in just a minute to Maimuna to talk a little bit about um, how her view on that, given not least because she's been driving a lot of the, the multi stakeholder dialogues in, in her region and really been a champion of building an internet community in the African region. Just before going to to you, Maimuna, I wanted to jump over to Miria very quickly to uh, sort of tie back to what Mewish was talking about in terms of the design about around protocol and so forth. Is there, um, is it possible to, to sort of consider the, the, let's say, consolidation consequences of the design in, in protocols or the sort of uh, larger second order effects of the design of the of a protocol? Is that something that you're discussing in the ITF and thinking about uh, how that might be a, a sort of avenue to to address these concerns. Yeah, so what we're discussing is um, how protocols to to understand better how protocols that get, get used. Um, um, as Andre said at the beginning, I said as well, uh, we build protocols as these kind of building blocks to have this like general purpose problem uh, platform that is open for innovation. But uh, we need to consider also what can be done with those protocols and how they can be used for the good or the bad, how they get deployed, what are the challenges for deployment, what are the incentives for deployment in order also to make our own protocols successful. So this is a lot of um, uh, the discussion we have and the lessons learned we have also in the last um, years in the IETF. And we specifically consider also about like um, discovery of new protocols of new services, so that it that it's it's open for everybody to access. Um, so we try to look at this in the protocol design, but at the end we don't make the deployment decisions. We can also only consider that and we can only try to set the right incentives to get the right deployment path, but it's not the ITF making this decision and, and it needs discussion between different st stakeholders in order to steer this in the right direction. Thank you very much. So there, there, there seems to be the, uh, an important role at least to have those discussions even at the, the protocol design stage and, and include those voices. And with that, I wanted to jump over to you, Maimona, who has a lot of experience in building those communities and, and including voices in discussions to talk a little bit about the value that you see of, of, of having inclusive governance structures for the open internet and your experience in, in, in driving such work. Thank, thank you, Carl. And um, I will start with what just, um, Major said about um, the technical standard organization like IUTF and ITU, and I think there is um, uh, a room for more openness and more inclusion from developing countries. And also, um, when when it comes to design and innovate, I think we we also need to raise the issue of the protection of our our innovation. Uh, mostly developed by the start, our startup, and we need to protect them from um, the, the largest company because most of the time we use our startup to develop innovation for our specific um, needs. And when, for example, this is um, 
they 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 see that is a very innovative. Uh, this this can be owned by a largest company uh, on the detriment of of uh, of our startup. And I think we need to have a kind of collaboration on this issue. And at this issue, I would like to uh, thank uh, and welcome the inaugural tech future tech forum. It was hosted by the UK government on 29 and 3rd of November this year. And this uh, forum tackled two crucial questions. How will technology and its impact in our society change over the next five to 10 years? And how can we collectively le leverage this future technology to tackle global challenge? That means that we are, um, uh, like the, the IGF, um, uh, we, um, we, we, we really need this uh, kind of open discussion like the IGF. Uh, since the beginning in 2007, uh, it was a place where uh, all the stakeholders come and discuss about the internet governance, but also about how could we make the internet more open and trustworthy. Yeah. And to come back to the, the multi-stakeholders model, I think we need to really think about this model because most of the time when we talk about from, from the government side, for example, when they, on, when they bring the private sector for them, it's multi-stakeholders. But when we, take, when we talk about the multi-stakeholders, we need to have representative from all interests of sector the private sector, the government, the academy, communities, the technical communities, and the civil society. And if a, each actor participates through uh, an inclusive basis, I think it is uh, the best way uh, to raise the interest of everyone and to make the decision uh, balance from, uh, from the, the interests of all the sectors. And I think it's, something has to be done on, on this uh, model to improve the model and to improve the involvement of, uh, of all the stakeholders. I think we, I, I don't know if I, can, I so can work on it at the global level, but we need kind of organization out of the UN who, are, who uh, really uh, tackle this, uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maimouna. And, and I think that that's also <clears throat> perfect uh, opening for the sort of uh, last part of this panel, which is to open it up for, for other participants and others in the audience to, to ask their questions to the panelists. And, and to Maimouna's point, really foster that, uh, that dialogue around these issues. We've heard from the panelists now giving some of their views around the open internet. And we'd be curious to hear from others in the audience if they have questions to the panelists. Uh, I see that there are a few questions posted in the chat. I'm not able to, to keep track of all of it, but my colleagues are helping me, so I'm, I'm trying to follow it on the side. And I see that we have a question to, uh, to Mehrish, I think, first from the audience on, uh, from uh, Jose Michaus. Uh, and the question reads, uh, I have a question for Mehrish. I really like what you said. I wanted to ask you about implementation of net neutrality regulation to maintain the open network. Do you think competition regulation with a market approach has worked? Or is it maybe now important to think about taking a rights-based approach in order to implement regulation uh, in this space? And he uh, follows with, by rights-based approach, I mean looking at other harms beyond market consolidation caused by ISPs. So basically, the regulation around uh, net neutrality, has it worked as it does now? Or is it valuable to take a, a human rights approach? Yeah. Thank you, Carl. And thank you for the question. I think it's it's quite a broad question. It's touching on a lot of different things. I'm going to stick with um, thinking about competition in the context of the human rights framework. And I actually think that um, if we're trying to, if, if the end goal is, well, I mean, I should say that the, the, we need the open internet. Uh, we need these the, all of these characteristics to be able to enable the free and full expression of human rights online. Um, you know, if we have gatekeepers, if, if people in communities don't have the ability to build their own services and technologies to be able to connect them to the global internet, you know, then, then we have an environment where 
the few providers that exist have enormous power over people's rights, including free expression, access to information, privacy, you know, freedom of association, and no real incentives to uphold their responsibilities to, to respect them. So, you know, if we're thinking about that as the, as the end goal, we, we want an internet that enables free and full expression of human rights, then we can think about competition and improving competition and, and looking at um, competition regulation as a tool to help us. So I think it's not an either or proposition of using a competition framework or a rights-based framework. It's really thinking about how we can engage with policymakers to improve competition. Like I said, not just at the content layer, but you know, across the internet stack to be able to um, to be able to improve the 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 enable to be able to enable um, human rights principles like freedom of expression. Thank you very much. And just a follow up question from me, Mewish, because uh, I like when you were speaking, I sort of teased out something that might be uh, uh, helpful for sort of taking some takeaways from, from this session. But you mentioned that an open internet is one that sort of enables the expression of human rights. Could that be a good sort of criteria for us to have when we're looking at the internet being more open or closed if it's able to, to facilitate the, the exercise of human rights? Absolutely. I really do think so. I think, you know, if we take each of these characteristics in their own stead, you know, the, the, the bigger picture, I think the, the zooming out, I really do see that, you know, that the extent to which the internet is able to enable free and full expression, that, that, is, that is an indicator of, of its openness. Um, because, you know, the, an open internet places power back in the hands of people and communities to be able to connect to each other in ways that respect and enable these rights, right? So in that context, absolutely. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, I see we have a hand as well from the audience, uh, Velimira. If you want to ask your question, um, please, please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carl, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah, Welcome. I'll try to be very quick. I just wanted to, to underline the very important point, I think, that uh, Miriam made about creating the right. Um, and just to present myself, actually, I, uh, I work uh, for the Internet Governance Team of European Commission. Apologies for this, I forgot. Uh, basically, what, what I think is important is to underline um, the point made by Mira about uh, creating the right incentives uh, um, around protocols and um, I think this is really important uh, to um, support not only, you know, connectivity to infrastructure, but also around protocols and um, different standards in order to ensure that open internet is provided everywhere in the world. And I uh, just wanted to very quickly mention, um, because I think this is of, of, of importance around the different topics that have been mentioned as main characteristics and um, um, to be uh, worked upon in order to ensure open internet is that um, uh, we had launched actually um, an initiative to which I have uh, put the link um, in the chat on um, Global Gateway, which is basically an initiative to support um, a deployment and investment in uh, connectivity throughout the world. And what I would like to say that this would be based really on very trustful partnership uh, and based on the need of the local communities. So I just wanted to, to say uh, for uh, participants um, to this panel that I think it is important to look into it and to see uh, how we could all uh, work in synergy and try to, uh, to grasp uh, the opportunities created by it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Velmira. And it's, it's encouraging to hear that there's a lot of audience and a lot of people out there that are thinking about this open internet and and thinking about different ways of, of sustaining it and making it even more open. Uh, we're approaching the end of this session. Uh, we only have one minute uh, left, unfortunately. Uh, I'm hoping the conversation around uh, these issues can continue either in the hallways, hallways in, in Poland, unfortunately, I'm not there, but otherwise online, and I'm sure we will have these discussions going forward as well. And I think on that uh, message from the panelists that there is a value in that inclusive governance process to actually find solutions to some of the challenge that we see to an open internet, whether it is around thinking around protocol deployments or competition, there is a value in having these inclusive dialogues and figuring out the solutions. Uh, 
But I want to extend a big thank you to our panelists for, for joining us today uh, in uncomfortable hours. Uh, it may be for some of you. So very grateful to have you on board. And thank you very much to my colleagues, Andre and Rinalia, Rinalia as well. And I wish everyone a great continued IGF. So thank you all very much. <laughs>